Hi everyone, I'm really happy and excited to be here with you. Uh, first of all, uh, I have some kind of tradition. I need to take a selfie with you all. Uh, so let's do it. Uh, wait, okay. Say cheese. Yeah, okay. So let's start it right away. So uh, about me, uh, so I'm passionate about software engineering. Uh, I've been doing that since I'm uh, nine years old. Uh, I'm a former Sedexis, a company which has been sold for 100 millions to Citrix. And right now I'm, uh, uh, yeah, that's Photoshop. And, and, and right now I'm the CTO of uh, Innovator. So it's a food tech startup. Uh, we're bringing um, basically um, a complete restaurant software uh, we have raised 10 millions, uh, we have 20 people in the uh, engineering team, and uh, my hobbies include microelectronics, like electrical skateboards, uh, and biohacking. Uh, actually, I'm like studying biohacking, so if some of you know about it, uh, I will be really happy to learn. Um, so, the talk of today is to talk about the key principles uh, for Node.js application in 2019. Uh, so designing Node.js application for scalability, observability, maintainability, and uh, Kubernetes deployability. Yeah, it's a big, uh, long title, I know. Um, so the timeline for that is we're going to start from scratch. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, DDD. Uh, does some of you know about it already? Could you raise your hand? Okay, nice. Okay, well, a lot of people actually, okay. Then uh, we will dig uh, into the solid principles, but from a TypeScript perspective uh, with a clean architecture. Then we will understand how to make our uh, service observable, like uh, from a DevOps point of view, logging, monitoring, alerting. Uh, then we will dig into uh, some kind of um, the key metrics uh, for avoiding bottleneck, performance bottleneck. And then uh, we will uh, try to make that service uh, ready for Kubernetes, like uh, what has the different requirements for doing so? Uh, how can we create the Docker for that? What are the props that we need to create? Uh, so we, we are going to dig into that. So first, uh, there are, in this talk, there are five key principles that I want to share with you. So the first one is about defining a service, the role of a service using DDD. Um, most of the time, when we are creating a new service, we are trying to think about uh, is our service too uh, short or, or too big? Well, um, there is a way of uh, identifying uh, the service um, is by using uh, one of the techniques is using something called event storming. Uh, who knows about that here? Whoa, okay, nice. Okay, so uh, here, uh, basically, the, the goal is to understand what are the different uh, domain events uh, inside uh, your business, inside the system. So uh, you're going to create some kind of workshop inside the company with all the people uh, who are doing business. So it can be like sales, uh, product owners, customers, I mean, you are looking for what we call the domain experts. Uh, these people will bring you what happens in your system. So, let's say we are running an e-commerce website. Uh, one kind of event might be uh, someone has ordered an hamburger, for example. So this is like something that you wrote and posted, and you push it on the wall. Uh, you will need like a really big wall, like maybe three meters. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, okay, um, so you you will need like a really big wall, um, almost three meters. It looks like that actually. Uh, this is something we did uh, at our company. Uh, it took us like one day to do that. Uh, so you putting post-its of all the different business uh, events that happen in your system, and then you're trying to organize them. Uh, so you want to understand uh, if uh, these events, uh, which events happens before, which events happen afterward. Uh, so you, you're like linking, uh, um, thinking in like, uh, uh, in terms of processes like onward and backward. You're trying to understand, okay, which order, uh, how can you map out all the different uh, events that happens inside my system. Then when you have done that, uh, basically cluster will automatically appear. Like here, we see we are, we are seeing a cluster here, here, there is another cluster, here, another cluster, and so on. 
So main goal is to identify the business domain. And basically what you will want to do is to have like one service or a set of service for one domain. When you have identified the domain, you need to understand uh, what kind of domain it is. Is it a core domain? Is it a supportive domain? Or is it a generic domain? So I will dig into that just later. And then finally, you need to understand the relationships between all your domains. So the goal of that session of uh, event storming workshop is uh, to share knowledge and identify domain events, to think in terms of processes, what's going on in the system, uh, onward and backyard. Backyard is actually very useful because, for example, during that session, uh, so we map out all the different events, and uh, by going from that point to that point, uh, we were able to see things that we didn't see when we were like looking for that point to that point. Um, so, last thing uh, is to classify the domain type and then to find domain relationship. So, uh, the domain type. Uh, I told I talk about three kind of domain. You have the core domain. Well, uh, this is the most important one. This is where your competitive advantage is. Uh, this is basically uh, engineering team uh, should focus on that maybe 90% of the time. Uh, this is the most important asset. Um, so this is the things that you should work on most of the time. Then you have the supportive domain. So the supportive domain is um, all the time too specific to buy. It's like something uh, really specific to your business, but it does not provide you any competitive advantage. Uh, for example, if you're running an e-commerce website, uh, that could be uh, some kind of VAT engine or something. So it does not provide a lot of competitive advantage because it's a market standard, but uh, you need like, to create it. And it's difficult to, to have like a software company who is bringing it to you because it's too specific to your business. And then you got like the generic domains. Um, so this can be reused across industry. Uh, for example, uh, payment, billing, uh, invoices. Uh, so it's not a good time investment for you to recreate a new payment gateway or a new billing system. So it's much better that you focus on the core domain that you outsource the supportive domain if possible, and uh, you buy something for your generic domains. Um, so these are like the three uh, different kind of domains. Then you need to understand the relationships uh, between your domains. So um, there is uh, something that we usually show as an example. It's an upstream and downstream uh, river. So, uh, let's say uh, you are fishing here. Um, if the upstream factory is not putting shit inside the, the river, it's okay. I'm going to have like good fish. Otherwise, um, I won't fish anything, or it will be like bad for my health. Well, it's exactly the same thing uh, in the services world. Uh, when you have an upstream service that is uh, bringing shit inside uh, a downstream service. Well, the downstream service will be constrained and it won't be able to, to have much velocity. And uh, here's the, the goal. If we think about uh, what we said just before about the core domain, supportive and generic domains, well, basically, um, your core domain must be upstream because uh, when you are upstream, it means that that's the team in charge of that domain that will decide what happens in terms of protocols, of communications, and in terms of contracts. Um, so if you're downstream and your core domain is downstream, it means basically that uh, someone else decides for your core domain, but you are like focusing 19% of your time on it. So you're not as free as you want to be, and uh, you won't get much velocity for that. Um, and that's also true for API. Like if you're like launching a new product and you got a new API, it might be a, a, a bad idea like to 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 get like a big customers on the API straight away because it will create some kind of relationship upstream, downstream that will uh, slow you down on your service. So um, if we summary, uh, use event storming for defining your domains, classify your, do your service into kind of domain, core, supportive, generic, and, and then find relationships uh, between your domains. So 
Uh, now, uh, we know the scope of a domain, we know what we want to do, and we know if it's core, or if it's downstream or, or upstream. Uh, so we are going to think about the skeleton of our service. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the solid principles, uh, but in TypeScript. Uh, so who knows about that as a solid principle? Okay, 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 a lot of people. Um, so there is basically five principles, uh, single responsibility principle, the open close principle, uh, something really weird that nobody understand really, it's like the, the, the least of substitution principle, it's kind of uh, difficult to understand, uh, the interface segregation, and the dependency uh, injection principle. So I'm going to go on each of them uh, with a TypeScript example. Um, but before that, uh, this principle uh, has been sorted by importance uh, but, uh, by uh, Robert C. Martin, uh, which is Uncle Bob. <laughs> um, uh, this guy uh, basically um, coined uh, the clean architecture and uh, did a lot of thinking around that. Um, so for him, uh, I think I got that from, uh, from a podcast uh, from him. And, uh, and uh, so the top thing to think is about the single responsibility. So one class does one thing, and that's all. Uh, second most important thing is about the de dependency injection. Well, uh, because uh, if, if you don't do that, uh, you will have like class interlaced, and uh, that will be really bad uh, for the design of the whole system. So if we dig uh, into that, well, single responsibility principle, uh, just do one thing uh, on each class. So what does it mean exactly? Well. Uh, it means that if you, if you have like something like that, uh, a class salary, um, and you have like two methods, uh, compute taxes and save, well, uh, basically you have two concerns here. Uh, you have some kind of business logic here and some kind of persistence logic here. So that's not good, you should split that away. Uh, so like by using, for example, two, two classes. Then, uh, the dependency inversion principle, um, so let's say you want to charge your phone. Uh, you're not going like to solder your phone to the electrical network. Uh, that would be bad design. Uh, you will need like an interface, and in this case, the interface is a socket. Uh, it's the same for classes and for software programming. Uh, if, let's say, uh, you have a class Ferrari, uh, start, stop, you have like some kind of car runner. Uh, is it running? Yes, no. And you got like, and you inject the Ferrari inside uh, the car runner. Well, uh, some of you might say it's dependency injection, but it's not because uh, basically it's, it means that uh, both classes are completely coupled and uh, you need uh, to have like an interface between. So a good solution here is to create some kind of interface. The so Ferrari will implement that interface and the car runner will use that interface. So you can uh, upgrade and move forward more easily and it's more maintainable. Then the open-close principle. Uh, well, basically here, uh, it means that when you have a class, uh, it should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So what does it mean exactly? Uh, let's say we're creating a payment manager. So we have like an enum, uh, with all the payment type. So we are accepting credit card, cash, Bitcoin, and uh, we have some kind of uh, payment manager class. Um, and this class is taking as a constructor the payment type, okay. And then you got some kind of function, pay, uh, with some if, maybe a switch or something. Well, here, what happens if you want to add a new payment type? Well, uh, basically you're going to edit the payment type maybe edit that function, but that does not comply with the solid principle that we just saw before. If we want to do uh, something that will be closed for modification but open for extension, uh, what we will do is we will extend that class and override the methods. So we have like cash payments, Bitcoin payments, card payments, and so on. Will be much more maintainable in the future so the Lipscomb substitution principle, so that one uh, is hard to understand. I mean, um, even the meme is not understandable. Um, so uh, I try to rephrase it uh, with an uh, English sentence. Uh, so it means that a subclass 
should not have, uh, should not behave in a such a way that will, it will not cause problem when used instead of the super class. So what does it mean? It means that basically you can switch classes uh, without uh, creating too much problems. Uh, when you have like a, a super class and then you switch it by a subclass. So uh, what does it mean uh, in code? Well, basically, let's say uh, you have like a, a project class. Uh, that class got a function. That function is just uh, doing some console output. So this is like the super project detail. Uh, and you have like two uh, different subclass. Uh, you have like the good list cost project one and the bad one. Well, the good one is going to call the parent class, the parent class method, before executing something more. Uh, and on the other hand, the bad class is going like to completely override the method, so it's kind of a broken design. So that one is bad, that one is good. Then you got um, the interface uh, segregation principle. Um, here, basically what you are trying to do is um, when you create uh, like methods, uh, clients should not be forced uh, to depend upon interface that they don't use. Uh, so it means that you should have many small interfaces. Uh, so in code, uh, let's look like at the printer interface. Uh, so that's a nice printer. Uh, you can print and scan. Uh, but the thing is, my simple printer does not scan. So here, what I'm going to do is uh, I must uh, implement that, that scan method anyway, uh, maybe throw uh, not implemented error or something. Uh, otherwise, I will have like some kind of TypeScript error. So that's bad. Here, what we can do instead is create two interfaces. First one, which will be called printer. Second one, which will be called scanner. So your simple printer uh, will implement the printer interface and the, like, the nice printer or the top printer uh, will implement printer and scanner. So it benefits of both worlds and uh, works really nice. Um, so um, we talk about dependency injection. Uh, we can um, create interface for this kind of injection, but there is a tool uh, that is uh, really growing right now in TypeScript. So it's called uh, Inversify. Uh, who knows about it? Okay. And uh, who is using it in production? Okay, I am. Um, so that one, uh, basically, it's a it's an inversion of control. So um, uh, let's not uh, create like a, a somewhere of an, an world and definition, but basically, inversion of control is on, is a uh, like dependency injection is a type of inversion of control. So, what is that exactly? Um, it allows JavaScript developers uh, to, to write code that adheres to the solid principle that we just saw before. Uh, it facilitates and encourages uh, best OOP and uh, IOC, so inversion of control practices, and there is very little overhead. Uh, so, we will dig into an example of that uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, but the main thing about Inversify is um, that we create containers and these containers uh, will include modules and these modules can be used as a, a, a can be injected inside if uh, uh, in, inside each of the of the classes that you are creating. So uh, let's talk about uh, the clean architecture. Well, uh, uh, this is I, I, this is something well. Well, no, that's not that, the clean architecture. I mean, well, that's Italy, but uh, okay. Uh, I'm kind of confused. Yeah, okay, that's it. Okay, that's the clean architecture. Uh, okay, it seems uh, imposant. It's, there is like a lot of stuff. So we're going first to understand what are we trying to achieve. Uh, we want to avoid uh, module coupling. Uh, we want like to have pieces. Uh, we don't want to have pieces of business logic spread everywhere inside the application. Uh, we want to do tests properly. Uh, we don't want to create technical debt that will grow over time uh, into like a big ball of mud and having to patch things everywhere over the time. Um, and we want like, yeah, a maintainable system. That's the main goal of the whole presentation is to have like maintainable system. So uh, let's get back to that. Um, so there is 
uh, first of all, there is a dependency rule. Um, here, what we see is there is different layers. Uh, each layer uh, represents uh, something very specific, so I'm going to dig into each layer. Uh, first of all, the main rule is that rule here, is the dependency rule. So um, you can only point uh, dependencies inward. Uh, so there are basically four, four layers. Uh, first one is the interface layers. Uh, so that's the entry points for your application. The interface layer is like uh, where you are going to, uh, to put like a, a HTTP RESTful API, the GraphQL API or something. Then you got the application layer. So the application layer is uh, responsible to mediate uh, between uh, interface and business layer. This is basically where you put all the use cases. Um, and then you got the domain layer. So this is the business logic. Uh, the domain layer is, uh, is, this is like the layer that will change less frequently because uh, once you have implemented the business logic, uh, it won't change a lot. So it's important to keep it like in, a, in one layer and do not interfere with it a lot. And then finally, you got the infrastructure layer. Uh, so that's the communication with the outside world, a database, uh, any kind of cache. Um, so, what's the benefits of uh, this architecture? Uh, there are a lot, uh, but first of all is each layer is completely isolated from the other one. So it means that, let's say, uh, you started a service uh, one year, two years ago. Uh, it was using MySQL, uh, working well, uh, but now you have some kind of new uh, business logic, so you, so you change the domain layer. Uh, but the thing is, uh, MySQL is not like, is no more a good, uh, a good system, like a good database for your service anymore. So uh, most of the time, it's really difficult because you will have to change a lot of things. Uh, but in this case, uh, you will have to change uh, only uh, the infrastructure layer. So the one communicating uh, with the database. So for example, you want to switch from MySQL to uh, MongoDB. Um, so you just switch the infrastructure layers and everything uh, still works. Uh, that's the beauty of this architecture. Uh, also, uh, you can uh, look at the, uh, the other way around. Let's say uh, you, you're providing some kind of HTTP API, uh, and you want to switch to a GraphQL API. Well, that's the same thing. You don't switch the infrastructure layer, you don't switch the domain layer, the application layer, you are only modifying the interface layer. Um, so that's uh, what we do uh, with the clean architecture. But uh, okay, uh, what's the real implementation looks like? Because there's a lot of theory, a lot of equation and stuff. Um, so uh, you stop using some kind of controller roots model folder. Uh, you have three main folders. Um, you can have also config folder or something like that. But the three main folders are application, domain and infrastructures. Uh, in application, you put your use cases, domains, you put the models and the repositories, and in infrastructure, you put everything that is uh, communicating with the outside world. So database, HTTP, uh, maybe you're using RabbitMQ or something, so MQP, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, let's dig a bit more uh, into that. Um, so um, let's create an index, index.ts. Uh, first of all, uh, we talk about Inversify. So first of all, we create an inversion of control container. And then we, we load into that container um, the other layers, so application and infrastructures. And then you want to start uh, your infrastructure, so uh, you start the local connection and you expose interfaces. So it means that it looks something like that. Here, uh, you're basically importing container uh, from Inversify. Uh, then you got some application module, so I'm going to, to dig into that uh, a bit just after uh, this slide. Then you got like infrastructure module, some kind of method, boot infrastructure. You define the container, so that's the main container of your application for dependency injection. You load both uh, modules, so infrastructure application, and then you boot uh, your infrastructure by giving the container to him. So if it all goes well, service is running, otherwise you got an error. 
Uh, and if we dig into um, the infrastructure module, it looks like that. Well, um, it looks like Java, actually. Uh, yeah, so you got like container, container module and interfaces. Then you need to define some kind of symbols uh, for, for having unique identifier uh, for each uh, of your uh, thing that you want um, to inject. So the infrastructure modules is basically some kind of union of interfaces. So you create a new container module. And you're going to define all the different things that you need. So you're going to bind. Uh, so I have uh, removed a lot of different imports, otherwise uh, don't get into that slide. But basically, you bind MongoDB, you give it an identifiers, uh, and you define one kind of scope do you want. So in this case, I just put it in singleton. Same for Redis. And then you put like some kind, for example, of repositories. So as I said before, you need an interface. Uh, so that's why I got like an I just in front. And then uh, you bind it to the implementation and, uh, and have it available in your, in, inside your application. So um, the benefits of that is it respects solid uh, completely. Each layer are, are fully testable. Uh, the dependency rule, uh, it ensures that your kernel is stable. So it ensures that the, basically your domain logic is protected and uh, you can move things around without affecting the whole application. Um, also, we keep the framework outside. So if you are using like uh, any kind of framework, Express, etc., uh, basically they are kept outside because of the way we design that. And uh, as we are using IOC, uh, we reduce uh, code coupling and we increase maintainability. So now uh, let's talk about observability. So I want to, to know what's going on inside my service. I want to have like logs, I want to have metrics. Um, so um, we need a lot of things. We need to, to store, we need to aggregate, to process, we need to create graph, to do alerts on the metrics. Uh, also, we want to do some kind of uh, custom metrics. Um, and uh, by the way, there is already a lot of different NPM packages uh, that will bring you um, um, metrics, like if you're using Express, Koa, uh, NestJS, or, or different framework, there is always, there is always uh, some kind of packages that will bring you uh, right on top a lot of different metrics. Um, and you need to store, to view, to query uh, all the logs in real time. Uh, the metrics should be updated in real time too. And uh, basically, this infrastructure should scale and handle a thousand of metrics and services. So how can we do that uh, without too much hurdle? Uh, well, uh, so I saw that uh, Elastic is a sponsor, uh, but basically, yeah, we're using a lot of uh, Elastic systems. Um, here, what's going on? This is where you put like all your apps, your services. Um, and then what's going on is uh, you want to, to logs, to save all the logs. So you, you're going to, to push it to something called Logstash, which is some kind of log queue. Uh, it will get all the logs. Uh, it's really scalable. Then Logstash will push these logs to Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is a document uh, database. The thing is you don't have any GUI. Um, so, um, so there is a lot of API. You can, uh, you can use the API if you want. But to have something more user friendly, you can use Kibana. Uh, which is that one. So Kibana basically will call directly uh, the Elasticsearch uh, API and display all the logs you need. It's very scalable. Uh, there is already uh, Elm chart existing, so you can put that in Kubernetes. Um, one thing that is important is uh, you should not uh, store uh, all the logs uh, of the existence of your company inside Elasticsearch uh, because of uh, cost. It will cost you a lot. You will need like a lot of nodes. Uh, so for example, at my company, what we do is we are only uh, using one month uh, of logs uh, and we have like some kind of a snapshot system. And if we need like to dig into issue from months ago, we can then load the snapshot uh, at one point and dig into that and then reload like uh, like remove all that data in order to avoid like huge cost. 
And then, so this is first part of the architecture. It's uh, basically a log aggregation and, um, and you can query and see it in real time. Uh, that's actually really fast. Uh, like from here to there, there is uh, um, like 10 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds. Um, and then you got the alerting, uh, alerting and metrics monitoring system. So that's that part, bottom part. Um, so here, maybe you notice, but here it's, the, it's push based. But on the other end here is pool based. So it means that uh, on your service, you need to expose something. Um, uh, so uh, you will need to expose a slash metrics uh, that will be available to Prometheus. This one uh, will go through all your services and get that data and store it. Uh, then you will need something like Grafana in order to explore your metrics, uh, doing some nice dashboards. Uh, but what you want to do is also to, to create rules on uh, these different metrics. So maybe uh, you want to watch if the garbage collector go wrong or if something goes wrong there. Um, so you create rules inside something called Alert Manager. And Alert Manager can uh, do a lot of things. It has like a lot of third party integration. One of them is PagerDuty. So uh, PagerDuty, a ni very nice tool like for getting notification. I can call you, <laughs> we can uh, send you SMS and so on. Uh, so when something goes wrong, metrics goes there, rules is triggered, then it notifies PagerDuty, which notifies the DevOps guy. Um, so that's the main principle of that architecture. So uh, what does it mean in terms of, uh, of code? Well, you expose the slash metrics uh, inside your node applications. Uh, you can use, as I said before, uh, some kind of existing NPM packages uh, for Express, for COA, etc. Or you can use uh, the Prom client, uh, which is, uh, I think, one of the, the most low-level one. Uh, so there are a lot of different stuff, but uh, things to understand is we can observe response time. And if we want to uh, display uh, that metrics inside slash metrics, we can do like, so this is uh, express style. Uh, we can do like Prometheus register dot metrics and uh, it will output in a, in a, um, in a Prometheus way uh, all the different metrics. So Prometheus can scrap it and then uh, do stuff on it. Um, so um, then fourth principle is about uh, performance bottleneck. Um, so we don't have much time there, so I'm going to go fast on this one. Um, well, there, there are two kinds of uh, most common problems uh, inside Node application. First one is memory leak. Um, so uh, we have a heap size of a maximum of 1.5 gigabytes for each process. So it means that uh, the heap size is like the universe uh, of uh, all the data that is stored inside your local processes. Uh, so Node.js is monothread. You have like one process, you have like the heap size on it. If you uh, store too much thing, or if you don't delete like the right variables at the right moment, uh, basically you will go through uh, that limits, the processes will crash. Well, most of companies uh, doesn't care about that because uh, when it crash, they got some kind of process monitor that will start again the processes. Um, so that's actually a bad thing because um, when it crash, you might have some kind of unexpected behavior. And also, uh, when you're using a lot of heap memory, you will have garbage collection running too much, too frequently. And uh, there is two kinds of garbage collection inside uh, node internals. Uh, there is incremental garbage collection so this is on the subset of heap. So it goes actually pretty fast and it do not stop the program execution, but you got like the full garbage collection cycle. And that one is stopping the program execution. So when you got um, memory leak, actually what's going on is garbage collection is going to go through that, going to stop the program execution. And if it does that, it will slower your application and it will make less responsiveness. Um, so you should keep track of these different KPIs, uh, process, heap size, time consumed for garbage collection, 
uh, maybe having some counters like for full garbage collection cycles and incremental garbage collection cycles. And then uh, you should also track how much uh, memory has been released uh, after garbage collection. So that's the first thing. And uh, the second, I, I, I will say, uh, um, the, the second like thing that we see that is causing a lot of uh, performance bottleneck is a, is an event loop lag. Well, event loop lag, um, there are two causes for that. Uh, first one is because you have some kind of long running synchronous uh, activities. Uh, so it can be like JSON parse, it can be IO, like file reading, file writing. Um, so this kind of, uh, of a synchronous process will make like your event loop go slower. So if it goes slower, um, that's not good because it makes your app less responsive too. And second thing that can happen is there are too many tasks per loop. Um, so that's actually a good problem uh, because it means that this can come from a lot of traffic, so that's a good problem. You have too much traffic and you need to scale your app uh, because one process cannot handle that much task in, in each cycle and each cycle will take more time. So in that case, what you do is uh, you just scale your application, but you have some requirements to do so. Uh, it must be stateless, uh, otherwise it will be hard to scale to multiple processes easily. Uh, KPI for that is uh, max latency, mean latency, and average latency. Um, so max latency is like the slowest event handling, mean latency is like the fastest one. So last principle uh, is how can we uh, deploy using Kubernetes? Uh, who is using uh, Kubernetes in production here? Okay, great, nice, okay. Um, so um, we have some kind of requirements if we want to do that in a nice way. And um, first of all, the mindset here is we want to have reproducible builds. Uh, we want to, uh, if we have something goes wrong in production, we want to easily uh, recreate uh, the state of the production locally. It's really important uh, so we can uh, understand what's going on. And um, if the Docker container uh, got secret inside or it's not stateless, it will be really difficult and, uh, we'll have, and you will basically make a take too much time to fix something. So here, uh, we need to have stateless applications. So it means no local states inside your application. It relies on external database or external caches. Then you have some kind of configuration management system, secret management. Uh, you can use something called Vault, for example, but most of the time that work is done on the CI or inside the CD. Then uh, you need Docker uh, to encapsulate your application uh, because you will be running Docker container inside uh, the Kubernetes cluster. Then you need a way uh, to tell uh, to Kubernetes uh, if your app is up and running and if it's ready to receive traffic. So that's called liveness and readiness probes. And finally, you need a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and uh, if you are poor like me, uh, you can use like a mini cube for local development. Um, first of all, uh, just be aware of vulnerabilities. Uh, if <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a nice company called Snick. Uh, basically what they do, they are like uh, processing a lot of Docker image. And what we see is that Node has the uh, most vulnerabilities. Um, so you need to, to watch out the base image you're going to use. Um, actually, what you can use is uh, the Alpine one, which is uh, the smallest one and uh, with, uh, with no vulnerabilities at all. Um, so this is an example of a Docker file. Uh, what's important here is uh, one thing. One thing is important here is just to have like your code pushed inside uh, the, the container at the last moment because Docker use some kind of layered cache. So if something change there, it will recompile all the, all the different things afterwards. So it means that as you're putting your code at the last, at the last moment inside your file, uh, everything before will be cached unless uh, you change one of the dependencies. And it happens not so frequently actually. So use Node Alpine, use also LTS, and uh, yeah, I didn't talk about it, but no root user, please. Here, as you can see, uh, we have created 
uh, where is it? Yeah, we have created like a, a node a user and uh, we're using that user for running the application. <laughs> then uh, the props part. So readiness, liveness, uh, it's simple, just a root, API root, HTTP endpoint. Um, so if, uh, if you output something between 200 and 400, uh, I mean less than 400, uh, it means that it's live. This is like an example of a, of a, of a, of a YAML, uh, which is a manifest for Kubernetes. So the probe is defined here. And if we want to look at some kind of something real, uh, like in production, it looks like that. Um, so you have like, uh, you define a deployment. Uh, that deployment uh, will load a Docker, a Docker container. So the Docker container, uh, where is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's their image. So we are pulling that image. We have like an image pull policy. Um, then uh, we need some kind of config. So we are using what we call config map. Uh, that config is very nice because if you want like to change the config without actually uh, redeploying and everything, uh, you just have to update the config map. It will update your deployment uh, in a second. Uh, then you define some kind of rollout strategy, like a rolling update uh, with um, some variables like max and available because when you're doing that, let's say you have like five pods running, uh, if you are like rolling out a new update, it will progressively take one out of the cluster, um, put like the new image in, take another one and so on. And uh, sometimes it can go wrong. So you, you want like to have like some max unavailable number of pods. And then you define the number of replica. So here it's one, but you can set 20, 60, uh, any amount you, you need actually because once your um, Node.js uh, application has been scaled out, uh, you can uh, easily uh, create a lot of replicas, but there will be new bottlenecks most of the time on the database layer. Uh, so you will need like uh, to work uh, with your DevOps team to understand what's going on, if it's coming from network, if it's coming from IO, if it's coming from database uh, limits. Well, that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>